So first of all, uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, to the session. Uh, so this is conversation three. Um, and we're going to talk about economic interdependencies uh, and uh, markets um, post COVID. Uh, but actually, I would like to propose that we broaden this a little bit uh, because to steal a sentence from um, Sven Smith, this is not the time for single issue optimization. Um, because it's not just a post-COVID, it's actually also um, a post-European uh, war uh, uh, and a post-energy uh, crisis and potentially stagflation that we're facing. Um, I'm just going to share a quick introduction slide and then um, uh, go on to the program of the next two hours. Um, yeah. So... I hope you see my slide now. Uh, maybe, Julia, you can confirm this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, okay, thank you. So what I would um, uh, basically like to propose is, is that we um, take the first hour of the session to uh, discuss uh, uh, everybody's uh, uh, view for five minutes, just a very brief introduction. Uh, and then we have a discussion uh, on this very broad topic, and uh, we have just decided to, to basically cut it in three parts. One is the question, how bad is it? So how bad are interdependencies being shaken up? Um, two, a bit looking forward, what are the costs of all this? What are the implications of realignment of global trade and financial markets? And the third question is about the policy prescription. So are we on the pathway for a sustainable, decarbonized, inclusive world still? Uh, uh, and also on, on financial and uh, trade resilience. Now, um, okay, I'm just going to stop sharing this. So I think uh, by means of introduction, um, I would just like to uh, start with the remark that I think we should be aware of how extraordinary uh, the period is in which we find ourselves. So, um, Basically, when I was growing up as a, as a teenager, I, uh, m one of my, 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 my biggest worries was that I was going to live and die in an era which was terribly boring. Nothing was happening. Everything was uh, stable. There was no roaring 20s. There was no loving 60s, nothing going on. Um, and if you look at this time now, so I have a teenage oh. daughter. And, um, and if you look at her last few years, so... In 2016, 2018, if we just take a step back, uh, we were already, I think all of you were already feeling that, um, that this was very turbulent because we were experiencing the phenomenon of Trump. Um, we were facing global trade issues and a US-China trade war, and there was the Brexit. And that already felt quite uh, turbulent. Now, if you look at the last two years, and maybe we're not at the end of this yet, on top of all of that comes a historic pandemic with a triple blow of global supply disruptions, local demand fallout, and an export shock on top of all that. And just at that, as that was fading out, we're basically uh, facing uh, a war on the European continent that we haven't uh, imagined for a very long time. And um, as that is happening, an energy crisis is unfolding, uh, inflation is occurring, and we're potentially looking at stagflation. And now to make it even worse, what's ahead of us is either a path of deep decarbonization that's also gonna bring upheaval, or uh, we don't do that and we're gonna face a path of environmental, humanitarian and economic catastrophes down the line. So I do think that we should not underestimate at what a crucial point in time we find ourselves and also, therefore, it's not that strange to talk about these very, very big topics. And therefore, I also want to express my gratitude for these really fantastic speakers that we have. Um, but we also have 10 of them. So I don't want to take any more time and just move on straight to the first speaker. And I'm just going to do this as I uh, view you guys on my screen. So I'm just going to start with Dahlia Marin. Um, uh, Dahlia is a professor of international economics at the Thomas School of Management at the University of Munich. And uh, she has a few slides uh, prepared. And um, so, so please uh, start sharing your slide and uh, let's begin. 
oh sorry maybe one thing for the for the audience you can respond using the chat function and participants can uh, raise the hand function and i will see that and moderate uh, all that to the best of my abilities so dahlia uh, go ahead yes so i would like yes so the global supply chain uh, are not growing since the financial crisis, as can be seen by this graph. Since 2011, the global supply chains are stagnating. So the question is, why have global supply chains stopped to grow after the financial crisis? Basically, the financial crisis changed the relative cost of global supply chains and robots. The increase in uncertainty in the financial crisis made global value chains more costly with the increased risk of a non-delivery of an input good. At the same time, the cost of financing a robot relative to hourly wages declined sharply when central banks tried to fight the crisis. As a result, uh, firms in rich countries reshored production back to their home country and invested in robots instead. After the financial crisis, global value chains and robots became substitutes. And this is shown by this graph on the right side after the financial crisis, um, with more, when a sector has more robots, it engages less in global supply chains. So COVID is accelerating this trend and leads to deglobalization. Uh, COVID is another enormous uncertainty shock similar to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. We find that the COVID shock lowers global supply chains by 35% and increases robot adoption by 76%. This number is a little bit higher and I can explain why. Moreover, the COVID shock has also led to an increase in shipping costs. In fact, during the, these two years, it increased by a, a tenfold. So this is an additional reason why global supply chains will be on retreat. Uh, let me stop here. I will talk about government in the discussion. Okay. Well, that's fantastic uh, fast, uh, Ms. Rin. Thank you very much for that. And we will get back to this um, uh, in the discussion. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, turn over the, um, the floor to uh, Adam Posen. So um, Adam Posen is the director of the uh, Peterson Institute. Um, please uh, take the floor. Thank you. And actually, I'm very happy to be following directly on Professor Marin's remarks because my, my point is, yes, we've seen these longer term trends on reversal or flattening of supply chains uh, accelerated by COVID, but I believe we should expand our concerns in two dimensions. The first is that a, the corrosion of globalization, as I've called it, that we're now undergoing, extends far beyond supply chains and trade and goods. Uh, those are the most visible and in some ways the most contentious, but we've been seeing a fraying and corrosion of globalization across other dimensions, such as cross-border investment, particularly a foreign direct investment as opposed to portfolio, of exchanges of people, of exchanges of ideas, of trade deals, of uh, business standards. And secondly, the other dimension is that it's not just COVID, and I know Professor Marin was focusing on that, not denying this, but it's not just COVID and production. It goes back to two longer term trends. First, the uh, anti-globalization politics in the US and to a lesser degree, the UK. We see it in other countries, other European uh, countries and other G20 countries, but nothing like it's been in the US. Um, and second, that the China divide with the US and also to a lesser degree with Europe are in the background. And so if we put all of this together, we have a world where it isn't globalization stopped or generally reversed, but where following the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, I expect to see these trends deepen and accelerate. 
And so the question is going forward, how damaging is it as our chair has put forward and what can you do about it? But just to say that while the supply, again, to repeat, while the supply chain curtailment is a rational response to a number of technological and risk factors, it's not necessarily the main driver here. There are deeper, longer term drivers at work. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Posen. Um, with that, I would like to um, give the floor to Carlos Arteda. Um, Carlos is the lead economist of the uh, Development Prospects Group at the World Bank. Um, so, Ms. Arteda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandra. Let me share some slides to for my presentation. Um, I want to uh, change gears a little bit, but just a little bit, and let me see whether this is... Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. Okay. Let's try this again. Am I am I being yeah. allowed to choose? Okay, let me see it. Well, can I share yeah. my slides again? Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Thank you. I do see there, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Arteta, I think there there are a lot of slides, so so do please try to confine your, your time with sure. five minutes. Thanks. Of course. Um, I'm trying to put it in my, in my in, uh, presentation mode. Okay, in any event, I'm trying to do the presentation mode, but apparently I can't. In any event, thank you very much for this uh, for, for this invitation. I want to switch gears a little bit and discuss what I think is an important issue, which is commodity markets and implications from commodity price cycles of the past uh, few decades and what they suggest for the future. And this is based on work that we did uh, in our last uh, Global Economic Crisis Report. And again, I cannot, I apologize, I cannot switch to, uh, to full screen, so please, uh, my apologies on this. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, as we know, commodity prices have experienced enormous variations in the past uh, two years, first with the pandemic and now with the work in Ukraine. Uh, as you may remember, by April 2020, uh, oil prices were actually uh, in negative territory, and now they have achieved a, a highs that we haven't seen since 2008. And this variation has an exception. As you, as you can see in these charts, uh, they show how energy, metals, and agriculture commodity prices have evolved through uh, um, previous global recessions. The red line shows you the medium of past global recessions, and the blue line shows you the current rebound. And as you can see, the, this, the collapse in 2020 and the, and the subsequent rebound has been exceptional, exceptionally quick and exceptionally strong. And uh, there are a number of factors at play, a, a rebound in global demand, but also uh, dislocations related to the war in Ukraine and disruptions related to commodity markets, which can be exacerbated by climate change. Um, now, these uh, uh, swings are nothing new, actually. As we saw in our last uh, report, we analyzed commodity uh, cycles from since 1970 to 2021. And as we can see in these slides, uh, the average commodity price calculus took about six years. You can see it in the left panel with large booms, as you can see in the center, and smaller uh, slumps. Actually, this is where a quarter of the speed of the bombs. And these cycles have been highly synchronized across uh, commodities. And with the business cycle, as you can see in the right panel, uh, on average, commodity price cycles were in the same cyclical pace as global IP 60% of the time. What does it imply? Uh, this implies substantial challenges for emerging market uh, commodity exporters, in particular for oil and gas exporters, which tend to be undiversified. Uh, metals and agricultural exporters are actually a bit less undiversified. And as you can see in these slides, the resource sectors in oil exporters account for more than half of exports. 
and about 10% of GDP. Now, for now, metals exporters are uh, less reliant on commodities and energy exporters, but this can actually change, and 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 this may change in the in the context of the energy transition. That is the shift from uh, fossil fuels to low carbon sources of energy. As you can see in the left in the two left panels, renewable energies uh, renewable energy generation is considered more metals intensive than traditional energy generation. And as you can see in the right. Uh, uh, hybrid and battery operated vehicles are much more metals intensive than those powered by internal combustion engines. Now, as the energy transition unfolds, it's possible that uh, metals exporters will see a strong increase in demand for their economies, and their economy will become actually increasingly more dependent uh, uh, on, uh, on resource exports. In contrast, traditional fossil fuels exporters might see demand wane, particularly high uh, cost producers. Now, that being said, and this is something that I would be interested in, uh, uh, in discussing uh, particularly with my fellow panelists, is how the war in Ukraine may affect the energy transition. Uh, higher energy prices as a result of the war threaten to disrupt or delay the transition to cleaner forms of energy. As several countries have announced plans to increase the production of fossil fuels, and in part as a matter of energy security. Now, high energy prices are also driving up the cost of renewable energies which depend on metals and, uh, such as aluminum and battery traded nickel. In the longer run, climate change will be an important factor for this transition, as the, and it may lead to repeated and more pronounced price, uh, price swings, and, uh, and particularly if uh, investment in fossil fuels soften and investment in energy, you know, energy resources are uh, increasing quickly. But let me stop here for the, uh, just for the for some matter of time, and I look forward to, to the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ortega. It was very um, interesting. Unfortunately, actually, I couldn't see your slides moving down, but maybe that that was me. Um, oh, I'm sorry. But but we could follow your storyline very clearly. So uh, thank you for that. Um, then I would like to uh, give the floor to Gunther Wolf. So um, Gunther is the director of Bruegel, the economic think tank of the European Commission. Please go ahead. Thanks. Am I interested in your work? Yeah, it's not not really uh, of the European Commission, but uh, but anyway, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's, we are based in Brussels, but we are really not a Commission think tank. So so let's just. Oh, let I'm very that. sorry. <laughs> Thank Take you. Thank you. No no problem. So so I mean just uh, I mean a lot has been said already, and it's difficult to add. But but I guess I, I just wanted to. Uh, follow up on uh, what Dahlia and Adam um, uh, were, were pointing out um, is, of course, that there's important political factors that at the moment uh, put a break on on globalization and, you know, might even reverse hyper-globalization as we, as we used to know it um, and compartmentalize um, not trade fully, but, you know, make it more regional uh, in, in some respects. However, I would also want to, to argue that there are important forces um, in, the, in the other direction. And um, I mean, just, just to give you one, one example, I mean, one example um, has been, and since we are talking here about the pandemic, has been, of course, um, trade in uh, medical, medical goods and the supply chains that were absolutely crucial um, during the pandemic to ensure a rapid increase um, in vaccine production. So I would argue that a lot of the, the forces of um, uh, globalization that really are beneficial um, are still there and will continue to uh, you know, drive um, and uh, urge us to continue to trade with each other. And I don't think that's a contradiction to, to what Dahlia and, and, and Adam said. It's just highlighting the fact that um, these um, these um, economic underlying economic trends and underlying economic logic is actually very important and very powerful. And when the when the WTO um, Secretary General uh, Mrs. Ngozi um, is actually highlighting the importance of open trade for um, uh, vaccine supply, for example, I think she does make a very very important point that uh, politicians. Uh, should not lightly uh, lightly dismiss. Um, so, so that's perhaps the first point. The second point, and you raised already the issue of of the war and the politics around it. And there, you know, I, I really think um, uh, that um, the uh, energy links between between Europe and and Russia, in particular, 
uh, will be uh, will be affected and will be cut and uh, will have to be uh, cut sooner rather than later. So I'm, uh, to be honest, quite disappointed by the slow pace of um, the decoupling um, of our energy imports um, in Europe from uh, from Russia. Um, this is um, not only um, the uh, key source of revenues uh, for the, the Russian dictatorship, we, we are estimating around uh, 1 billion per day in revenues that, you know, really help regime, help the regime and help, um, help him pursue, uh, help Putin pursue, pursue the brutal war. Um, but it, it is really um, a shame that, that we, are, we are not um, showing the courage and, and the leadership to, to decouple um, from, from those energy supplies. Um, now, then the question is how you can do this and what's the best way of doing it. And there's a long discussion on this. Uh, but it seems to me that um, in the short run, um, one of the most promising options is um, the option of um, imposing tariffs um, on uh, imports uh, from from Russia, uh, I think this would work. I mean, tariffs on both oil and gas uh, would be an effective way of um, cutting and reducing the the rent that Putin makes currently on the sale of these um, fossil fuels. Um, and uh, I would argue, and I mean, we don't have much time. I would argue that the elasticities. And sorry to use this jargon, um, the elasticities of demand and supply are such that the incidence of the tariff, the incidence of the tax uh, will mostly fall on Russia and the revenues um, from um, the tariff uh, will be large enough uh, to compensate for the slight um, price increase that we will observe um, in the European markets. So it seems to me this is a thing we should do and we, we need to do uh, for moral reasons. There's a big discussion uh, what are the economic consequences um, of a full embargo? Um, so at the extreme, of course, the counteraction by, by Putin could be to, to close the tap. Um, and, you know, even, even the most extreme scenarios um, that I've seen amount to um, a GDP, um, a negative GDP, GDP effect of something of around five, five percentage points. Now, then you can have a debate whether it's worth paying that price or not. I mean, that's more a political debate and not an academic debate. Uh, but, but it seems to me that um, those that are saying that everything will collapse um, or entire industry, industry sectors will completely collapse, um, they, are, they are quite wrong. Now, that's the short term. That's the short term. Um, uh, energy relation with Russia, the medium to long term uh, discussion, it seems to me is is how quickly we will be able to um, uh, move from uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy. Um, and, you know, there um, uh, actually the geopolitical implications um, of the Green Deal, so of Europe's quest to fully decarbonize its economy are quite major because um, we will uh, sooner or later uh, become relatively independent uh, from fossil fuel imports, and we will start instead importing other other forms of of energy, including possibly green hydrogen, and and that will will lead to new new trade uh, relations and new dependencies and new inter, inter interdependencies. And I think this will be very interesting to explore further. Let me stop here with some initial thoughts. My initial thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wolf. Um, yeah, I see already a lot of uh, interesting linkages between the things you've said uh, so far in this panel. Um, let's, I think this, there, there is a nice bridge to make to uh, the points that Ezra Prasad um, is, I think, going to put forward. Um, uh, because basically uh, he is relating um, what is going on in his view in the, in the digital currency uh, developments also to the efficacy of um, economic sanctions. So let me pass the floor to Azar Prasad. Thank you very much. Um, certainly new digital technologies um, that are very fast evolving provide the promise of bringing the world together in ways that could be very beneficial. Um, the fact that international payments are now going to be beset by fewer impediments um, related to differences in technology, technological protocols, um, languages, um, 
regulatory issues, all of that is certainly going to uh, mean that uh, payments related to trade are going to be uh, less beset by frictions. Um, you're going to have easier access to global pools of capital, access to international portfolio diversification opportunities. So all of this in principle should have a leveling effect. It could make it easier for small and medium enterprises to get easier access to credit. It could make it easier for even low net worth households to have access to these uh, investment opportunities around the world. But while this promising future is certainly out there, I think we also have to keep in mind that there is a potential for technology to lead us to a very different um, outcome where in fact, um, we might have, rather than the democratization of finance, um, much more fragmentation in the financial system, a variety of risks, and these risks falling upon those um, low-income individuals, also uh, poorer economies that are least capable of dealing with these risks. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, certainly on the benefit side, one can see that for economic migrants sending remittances back to their home countries, the ability to conduct those transactions at much lower fees than they pay right now, being able to conduct those transactions effectively immediately is going to be a big boon. Likewise for importers and exporters, the ability to settle payments practically in real time um, is going to reduce some degree of exchange rate risk related to um, the time it now takes to settle those transactions. It becomes easier to track transactions in real time, um, which is certainly going to be a benefit as well. But at the same time, there is this concern that as you have more channels for capital to flow across countries, we might end up in a situation where in fact you have much greater volatility of capital flows. Now for emerging market countries and developing economies in general, capital flow volatility, some of which is of their own doing, but some of which is also the result of policies undertaken by the advanced economies might in fact um, create even bigger problems for these countries. So capital flow volatility and exchange rate volatility are certainly major considerations for developing economies. There is also the prospect that as we see digital currencies proliferate, while payments are going to become a lot more efficient, we could move into a world where the major currencies such as the US dollar, the Euro, and perhaps even a digital version of the renminbi once that becomes available for use abroad, could start competing more directly with the currencies of small economies or countries that do not have credible currencies or central banks. So one can well envision a world in which there is a significant fragmentation between uh, the upper echelons um, of the um, international financial system and the lower echelons, especially the smaller countries and developing economies, which could lead to the loss of monetary sovereignty of many of these smaller economies and with uh, uh, many of the deleterious consequences that would come from that. Um, in addition, of course, cryptocurrencies, uh, um, which are all the buzz right now, do seem to have some potential in terms of at least catalyzing a technology um, that could allow for the democratization of finance. But here, too, the question is whether we're going to lead to a world of actual decentralization and fragmentation, which could be positive in some ways if that means more competition and innovation. <coughs> but it is equally likely that we could end up in a world with even greater concentration um, not just of economic power, but also um, financial wealth. So we are in the cusp of some interesting changes that could go either ways. And I think how governments um, react to these changes, what sort of regulatory frameworks they put in place is going to be crucial to ensure that we can get many of these potential benefits while ensuring that we do not go down a path that leads us to even more concentration and even more inequality. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prasad. Um, very interesting new perspective uh, to this uh, discussion so far. So I would like to uh, move to uh, Sven Smith, um, director at McKinsey Global Institute and a senior partner at uh, McKinsey & Company. Uh, thank you. Um, clearly, we uh, are living in a period uh, that is paining us, at least uh, you know, with all my European art, I didn't want to feel that this happens on our territory. At the same time, I recognize, having talked to people all across the world, that something that's as close in Europe is actually far away in other places. I was with a group of people in Chile 
And they actually were talking about commodity opportunities. And I would say the war was as far away as Afghanistan used to be to us. It's a bit strange when you sit here in Europe, just, you know, it feels very close here, but for the rest of the world, it is in a slightly different balance. They, of course, experienced the high energy prices and they experienced the high food prices and some of the supply chain disruptions. The leveling off of globalization as a level, I think is clear and we've all discussed it already today. The one thing I do want to say is that that level is still pretty high. And so to me, the real discussion is what will we do with the level that we have? Will this go down very fast or, or not uh, in all the discussion that we just have? And I think maybe the framework that we had was a little bit too simple. It was globalization or not. To me, the other axis that is being discussed is source diversification. Because what has happened under the umbrella of globalization, of trade and all kinds of things, people and companies and countries have become source dependent. And I think the, the first thing that we might see now is that we actually are trying to diversify source. And one proxy where we already see this is if you look at letter of credit growth in banking, which is a proxy of you know, how many international deals are done, uh, they're actually growing quite fast at the moment, which is, if you go deeper into it, you can see that that is actually approximating that people are diversifying source. Let me take a very concrete example. In 2014, when the Crimea action happened, um, there was still a dependency of 80% from the Ukraine on NAOM for the semiconductor industry. When the Ukraine war broke out, you know, we had the 30 to 40% stories uh, out there. But the reality was that when in 14 this happened, the companies already reduced dependency by half, and they now have alternative sources that probably can rebuild the last 30 to 40% pretty fast. That, that, that particular issue might not become a problem. But what is the same for uranium? What's the same for gas? What's the same for cobalt? What's the same for nickel? What's the same for potash? And so I do believe that in our framework of thinking about globalization, we miss the axis of the risk of being too dependent on single sources. And in particular, if these sources also still have, you know, call it a, a government that might not be always favorable to us. And so the bet in globalization might have been a bit too much to that. The second point I want to make is, and in that I see some silver lining, which is always hard to say in a period like that, but COVID had a silver lining. It taught us how fast we can move at scale if we really want to. And that was true in digital and lots of other things. The silver lining here might be that we are actually learning how dependent we are on certain things and whether that's the right answer, uh, business by businesses, countries by countries. But the second thing is we're also learning what it, what happens when energy prices are sustained high and when food prices are sustained high? And I think it will teach us a little bit that we are operating in the energy system with something that makes the world go round. And if we're not careful, we could lose quite a lot by doing this wrongly. So I think we're actually learning what it is and how important energy is. I think energy was often sort of felt as something that's separate to the rest of the economy. It moves and it's a commodity. We don't even count it always in an inflation until it really bites and then we do need to count it. And so I hope this is a teaching moment where we're not going to throw the full globalization out with the bathwater, but we're actually going to learn that within globalization, we should be careful on being too dependent on single source. And that in that, we also learn that you know, we need to be a little careful how we play the energy game. But one of the reasons why energy prices are now very high is we curtail the investment in traditional sources faster than we built up the renewable sources. And that led to an imbalance. And once you have a tight system in oil and gas, very small disruptions lead to massive price of flyups. And that's what we're noticing right now. And I think everyone who's leading nations and companies needs to learn just how sensitive this system is and that we need to get it right. When we want to do the energy transition right, we actually have to do it in balance. We can't create a shortage and then hope we can still do the rotation because at the moment you can see, and this was said by others on the call here, that with this, in this price environment, nobody is thinking about accelerating the transition because you know, we first need to solve this issue. But for that, we actually have to create conditions that the old stuff is being produced again. And energy producers are actually reluctant because they say, well, the moment this is over, you're going to cut us again. And so this system of balance, we need to be very careful with. And I think we're learning a lot at this moment. Now, in that learning, I hope there's progress, but uh, that might be some silver lining. 
Well, thank you very much. That was very, um, yeah. So a lot of a lot of uh, uh, yeah, great great kind of uh, angles for the discussion later. Thank you very much. So let's move to Andrea Conte. Um, Andrea is um, an economist at the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Commission. Andrea, floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I will share some uh, some slides uh, in order to indicate to you uh, the logic of the activities we are uh, we are conducting at the Joint Research Center. Uh, this is the now Science Service of the European Commission. Can you see the slides, right? Yeah. Okay, you can see my my move as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Yes. So our mandate is basically to focus on the territorial effect of policies. So the angle of my intervention will be also to discuss recent uh, structural changes, challenges we have ahead from the territorial angle and the way in which in the European Commission and through the science service, we provide evidence for policy making. So the logic uh, that we apply consistently is what uh, is reflected in the generation of evidence through the better regulation toolbox, where it's clearly highlighted that the territorial aspects are a fundamental dimension of analysis. We strongly believe so, and we think that uh, territories uh, and territorial aspects are relevant for policies, uh, even when they are uh, communicated as specially blind policies. Everything, virtually everything, from climate to innovation, to education, to fiscal, could have a territorial impact. So we need to assess at the subnational level the implication, the behavioral changes that those imply for the economic agents in the territory. I will try to show you uh, in these slides, how do we do? So basically through the method, uh, we have uh, quantitative methods mostly from econometrics to modeling tools that we apply for assessing uh, the uh, relevant impact uh, of funding instruments. We, of course, take care of the major funding instruments of the European Commission in order to counteract some crisis, as for instance, the one we witnessed on COVID. I will spend uh, in, in the next slide a few seconds on the other one. But also we take care of the territorialization of the imp economic impacts of regulatory reforms. So basically when money are not involved, but also major structure value chain type of analysis. This resembles the discussion we are just having. Uh, Ukraine is a major, it's a major drama, but for, in economics terms, will have major implication in terms of disruption of value chain. With COVID was the same, with Brexit, we have witnessed something similar. So the the importance of developing subnational tools and the way in which, for instance, we address some of those type of analysis through a unique set of regional input-output tables for Europe. We are able to portray the economic of each single uh, NATS2 uh, region in the European Union and therefore going beyond the national level in order to assess the potential economic uh, impacts. This is fundamental in the moment in which we want to interplay several, uh, several dynamics. I show you this slide where you see uh, the general trends uh, and the divergence in a sense that we are witnessing in Europe, in some cases across countries, in some cases within countries. But what you see on the right, can you confirm you are seeing the slide? Yes? Yeah? Yes. Uh, what you see on, on the right side, on the tourist vulnerability, are an example of the importance of going beyond the country level analysis for assessing the importance of value chain. Now, we are considering and analyzing through input output tables, through the different tools I was mentioning to you, a number of vulnerability indicators. So how your territory can be subject to exogenous shocks, uh, like when we had the case of COVID, the shutdown on the entire touristic industries. Of course, this type of analysis can be replicated across sectors. It can be replicated to mimic several types of shocks. Uh, we have partner with several research organizations, for instance, in assessing the economic implication of the different scenarios of trade shutdown due to Brexit. Of course, now what we are witnessing in a different political context, much more dramatic, of course, is a, an example of the importance of going subnational in order to spot 
the matrix of sectors territories which can be more affected and where we need to concentrate a bit more the economic intervention. I finish uh, just to say that basically we try to interplay these shocks with major trends. I don't have the time to discuss those, but basically just to say that we really need to take the big picture into account. Uh, and the logic of this is to basically come up uh, with those evidence that then will be used by policymakers, the European Commission, the Council, and so on, in order to design the optimal response to shocks, to crisis. An example is, for instance, the Commission Next Generation EU and the communication that President von der Leyen did in May 2020 to the Parliament, announcing the community collective response to the COVID crisis where exactly this type of analysis were embedded just to show the strong asymmetry, both sectorial in terms of value chain disruption and territorial of the COVID crisis. And along this line of work, we are continuing providing our quantitative analytical support in order to design the best policies for counteracting the shocks we are witnessing now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Um, uh, yeah, so I have three more speakers on my list. I'm just uh, going to, because I can't see everyone, I'm just going to try to give the floor to uh, Eva Kiali. Eva, are you out there? Um, Eva is the Vice President of the European Parliament and the Committee Chair of STOA. Um, but I can't see her. Maybe Julia, uh, Julia is the host in the background. Um, could you try to contact uh, Eva? Uh, yeah, but, uh, uh, Eva is not scheduled for this day. Ah, okay. So she, okay. she was on the program, but okay. Then we're, oh, we're just okay. going to move on. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's not that we have any lack of uh, speakers, so that's, uh, that's fine. Um, uh, then I would like to move to uh, Moreno Bertoldi. So Moreno is the special advisor uh, to the ambassador um, and the head of the economic and financial section uh, at the delegation of the EU to the US. That's a whole mouthful, but um, very welcome, uh, Mr. Bertoldi, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sandra. I was special advisor to the ambassador until end of December. I'm now back in Brussels. I'm still advisor on international economic and financial issues. Um, a lot has already been said, so I will try to focus on an aspect that maybe has not been uh, um, much touched uh, uh, so far, that is the impact of what's going on on global economic governance. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the pandemic have further widened um, some of the fault lines that emerge at the end of the last decade and looks unlikely uh, that we'll be able to return uh, to the economic and financial interdependencies that characterize the pre-pandemic world. In fact, I mean, going forward, uh, we, have, uh, we will have to tackle what uh, Adam has called, um, also in his intervention today, <clears throat> the corrosion of uh, globalization. So the... Um, uh, with regard to uh, international economic governance, uh, we'll probably have to move to uh, variable geometry configuration. Given the tension between some of, the main, of its main members, cooperation in the G20 will become more difficult. Uh, still some global challenges, uh, uh, for instance, the climate transition, debt relief for fragile countries, food security, addressing global health issues, require the major economic powers to work together to find uh, solutions. Uh, this should still be possible, I think, as G20 members uh, have an interest uh, that uh, these global challenges are tackled through an equitable burden sharing. In this respect, the G20 should remain the forum to deal with this type of issues. Moreover, by addressing some of these challenges at global level, we would also be able to create new forms of financial interdependence. I'm thinking, for instance, of green finance, where some convergence of taxonomies would help develop financial instruments that would allow the mobilization of significant private financial resources to be used across the globe to fight climate change. In other areas, uh, given the current divergence of approaches, as well as geopolitical rivalry, it will not be possible to agree on policies based on global consensus. 
there are four existing fora like the G7 or new ones uh, uh, regroup, uh, uh, regrouping uh, like-minded countries are likely to fill part of the void like by, by the corrosion of globalization. For instance, a lot can be done by providing support to low and medium income countries for infrastructure development in a sustainable way. The EU Global Gateway and the US uh, Build But Better Award both go in this direction and other advanced countries can join to help reduce the infrastructure gap in the developing world. As the expansion of uh, global economic interdependence looks now unlikely, economic interdependence between allies and like-minded countries involving the advanced and the developing world becomes uh, both a geostrategic imperative and a way to counter trends that negatively affect uh, economic uh, efficiency and technological progress. In this respect, I see a lot of potential in the work carried out by the EU, US Trade and Technology Council, where the EU and the US try to lead the way in shaping the rules, tools, and standards of the future. To be successful and becoming attractive also to countries that initially choose to stay on the fence, this expanding economic interdependence among like-minded countries will have to address some of the issues that led to the backlash of the previous globalization and ensure in particular that it will not lead to growing inequalities and unsustainable social and environmental outcomes. To conclude, even if the post-COVID world will be more fragmented than the pre-COVID one, there is room to revolve international economic and financial interdependence, in particular, but not only among democratic countries. Over time, this interdependency could lay down the basis of a new multilateral liberal order. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bertoli. Um, and then last but uh, not least, and I'm, I have actually not uh, seen him also on the screen yet, but, um, but Julia, maybe you can help me out. So on my list, I have also Altmark uh, Karas. Um, he is the vice president of the European Parliament. No, he's not there. Not there. Okay. No. So um, then there is eight of us uh, left, and um, that is not such bad news because it uh, it could uh, make the discussion more uh, uh, more focused. And I would like to um, basically start with the first part on um, on on the question how how bad is it? So so how badly are these interdependencies? Um, yeah, being being disrupted basically at this point in time, um, and I have uh, written down some uh, so, so, some pros and some cons, and and uh, yeah, it's hard to kind of be conclusive on that. So I wanted to kind of open the floor uh, to that. So maybe just to start it off, on the one end, uh, indeed, uh, Adam Posen has started with that the corrosion could be beyond what we currently see in in in, in for example, global trade. Um, I also heard uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Prasad that the risk for currency fragmentation is out there uh, and also a lack of financial access for uh, small uh, governments and uh, SME firms. Um, Sven Smith mentioned that the dependencies on, the, on, on single sourcing uh, is a vulnerability that we are discovering. And of course, then also there is the empirical evidence that we just saw on the uh, unevenness of the, um, the geographical unevenness on the impact, for example, uh, in terms of uh, tourism uh, intensity. Um, I think that on the other hand, there are also counter forces. And a few that I've heard is that and, and we, they basically all come down to the silver linings of that there often is more resilience than pre-imagined before uh, something in an up, uh, upheaval happens. So I think that um, uh, Guntram uh, uh, greatly pointed out that, that there is indeed the, um, the issue of the, uh, 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 of the GDP implications from, from uh, an energy embargo on the EU side. Um, and that the implications might be not as dire as, as we think uh, beforehand. And of course, there's also the technology um, that has the potential of reducing a lot of frictions uh, in finance and trade. Now, 
Um, to open the floor, who, uh, um, what is your view? Uh, and maybe you can just raise a hand if you want to contribute here as a panelist. So what is your view on the balance of things, of the pros and cons in terms of uh, how bad is the disruption? And maybe just to put it in the light of to what extent is it to a lasting uh, realignment or is this a temporary shock? Who wants to kick it off? Um, turning the pages if I see some hands. I see uh, Dalia Marin having a hand up. Yes, go ahead, Dalia. Yes, um, so I think that the Ukraine war is a uncertainty shock on top of the COVID shock, which means that the duration of the disruption in supply chains matter for firms. Uh, mm -hmm. If they started to think during the financial crisis whether they should, should change their business model in global value chains, uh, they definitely will do so with the I Ukraine war because for, the, for firms what matters is it doesn't matter whether the reason why the input doesn't arrive is because of the pandemic or because of a, 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 of, of, um, of a war or because of a natural disaster. What matters is that it doesn't, it doesn't arrive. And so I think that firms do readjust now. And I don't think that this is a transitory thing. I think they just change the business model of, of how they produce. And therefore, it's not going to be like after the financial crisis when there was this, this trade collapse, but then there was this recovery. And um, here, I don't expect that to happen because firms will just readjust and that will be a permanent change. Even so, I have to say that the transport sector is in turmoil now. So uh, the shipping costs have increased tenfold. They are now coming back, but that's an additional force uh, that leads firms to readjust. Uh, there is a discussion whether the transport sector turmoil is, is, is transitory or um, will last for longer, um, but still, so I'm less optimistic that this is going to be just a transitory shock. Yeah. Thank you. I see Sven Smith has a hand up. Yeah. yeah I want to make, bring out one contrast between the COVID crisis and the uh, and the Ukraine situation. Both I fully agree with uh, Daria that uh, are continuing to have elevated levels of disruption and so on. However, I do think the supply chain crisis during COVID was actually mis. Uh, spelled in the news, not in economic analysis, but in the news, it was misspelled. The reality was at the back end of 2021, a unprecedented amount of goods were shipped because we had a demand shock that was actually then stimulated out of demand into a massive demand for goods while services demand was still held back. And so you got this rotation and the actual supply chain performed at a dramatically higher level, at a surge that is higher than anything we've seen in decades. And so this was the largest surge in actual shipped goods. And what you find is that anything that's sort of near capacity in a dramatic demand shift leads to massive fly-ups of prices. And I think that's the other thing we're learning. So the shipping costs are up, not because the ships are not shipping. We just have too few of them for the goods that are... And so what was about to happen due to COVID exit was services demand was supposed to get up, the product demand was going to go back down and it would sort of settle a little bit at a new level. So, but now we are actually in a supply shock. And I think if, you, and I see companies do something very different right now in their analysis. During COVID, they were doing a demand shock modeling, like how much demand do I get and can I supply it? Now they're actually saying, can I supply what I can sell, uh, but do I have the supply? And it's, it's actually slightly different dynamic. And I, I believe we're actually going through the supply shock and we need to learn that dimension. And that's why this consequence of high energy prices, high food prices, 
high logistics cost prices and supply chain disruption, I think is going to be the lens for the future, and in particular with this dependency point. Yeah. Clear. Um, Guntram. Yeah, I mean, I, I was trying to understand a bit better this this transport um, disruption issue that that Dahlia raised, and and perhaps also play the bay, the ball back back to Dahlia. I mean, I think what what we are seeing now, of course, when you look at the uh, the ports of of Shanghai, I mean, we are seeing all these ships outside of Shanghai, right, that cannot really uh, deliver and uh, be be ship uh, be loaded and unloaded. Um, however. Is that really the transport sector or isn't that much more sort of a pure pandemic effect uh, in the sense that China uh, not only has a very special uh, COVID policy with its zero COVID uh, strategy, but also has a vaccine that is much less effective than um, the vaccines uh, that uh, circulate in the West and uh, arguably is less less effective uh, in my understanding against, against the Omicron variant um, than than the typical Pfizer um, uh, and, and 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 other Western Western vaccines. So so as a result, China in a sense is is quite exposed to this very uh, virulent and very contagious Omicron variant, um, while uh, having basically um, a, a naive immunologically naive population, and therefore almost is forced to um, actually implement relatively tough. Uh, lockdown measures that then in turn, of course, uh, mean that that ships can't be loaded and unloaded and that that pr production processes are interrupted. And, and just, I mean, just for the sake of argument of the argument, just to push, push us a little bit further, um, you know, I'm wondering on the on the on the virus induced disruptions to globalization. Um, yes, there is volatility that yes, there are still some shocks. But um, but I, I mean, in the absence, I mean, if, if I mean, it all depends to my mind here on on how the virus and how the epidemiological situation will will evolve, right? I mean, will we uh, will this become now a less virulent, less uh, less dangerous virus, um, or will we see new uh, new variants emerging uh, uh, emerge that that become very um, uh, very dangerous again for our health. And if the latter is the case, which I mean, I, I'm, I'm, what epidemiologists tell me is that it's quite quite possible that, you know, there, there are bad scenarios out there, you know, then of course we will see again disruptions, but it will be not just disruptions to the transport system, it will be disruptions in general to economic activity. So, so I, I'm, I'm wondering whether the transport system is, is particularly affected or whether it's much more general um, uh, sort of economic uh, disruption due to lockdown measures that we have to undertake to to deal with this virus. Uh, I mean, this is just a, sort of my five cents to raise a question here. Yeah, Dalia, do you want to respond? Yes, uh, I mean, I I'm I'm less less optimistic that the disruption in the transport sector will go away very soon, and not because. Uh, because they are, it takes time and this, uh, until these containers unload. But because, you know, what happened it, it was is there is an exodus of transport workers. And during the pandemic, some of these workers stayed on the ships for several months and they just discovered that uh, this is a bad job, that, uh, that is less, it's not well paid and they just uh, left uh, the transport sector. This is also true for the truck drivers. There was a big truck driver crisis because of it. So I don't think you are going to resolve it that easily because this is not a very short term phenomenon. Um, but, but a question that, that remains uh, with me now is that um, what, what Sven said is that the, um, basically the excess demand uh, was during COVID was basically uh, mainly responsible for the, for the supply disruptions. And um, if that excess demand is temporary, then that part of the, of the supply shock will eventually fade away. But if I hear you correctly, uh, Dahlia, you, th you think that the, um, and actually maybe Sven is saying that as well, that, that the, the, the war and, and, the, and the realignments that we're seeing now, and maybe also to 
to broaden this a little bit further to the um, to the energy transition uh, that is like slowly actually pretty fast playing into all of this. Um, does that mean that the supply disruptions uh, have to be uh, for a more permanent time? You know, I, 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 the, the trans I, I have been told that in the transport sector, there is also a change how they pursue their business, you know. So they, they are leaving out uh, smaller ports and they are just going, through, uh, going to serve the big ports. And uh, this, I don't know what this change in, in the transport system will make for, for the longer term. So I'm, I cannot be, I, I'm, I don't know. I, I basically don't know, but I'm more doubtful that the problems that have come up triggered by the pandemic will be resolved that easily, even if demand goes down, you know. Yeah. Um, Adam, please go ahead. I think Eswar's hand was up before mine, but I'll just I'll just go okay. ahead. Um, the we're we're debating a lot of things here, and you're doing your best to marshal us. And I think it is important, as Sven said, that for most countries in the world, the level of globalization on various measures remains quite high. Um, but I, I think we have to um, look at two other things. The first is let's not forget that the advanced economies, as they're called, had a sudden downshift in productivity growth around 2003, 2004. There are various explanations. We can go into it. I think it's partly associated with choices to deglobalize. And in any event, the US retreat from globalization is making some of those productivity trends worse in various ways including by putting up barriers to innovation. And if we look ahead, and others on this call can talk about this better than I, but we look ahead to a world where national security concerns about technology transfer are only going to increase as a result of China, US, as well as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I worry about continued diminution of large-scale innovation. Obviously, there are always going to be individual companies and individual scientists and researchers doing innovation. So I, I think we have to, we can't say that that's the only determinant of productivity trends, but I think we have to see this in the context of the problems of productivity trends. The second point is this issue of supply chains healing themselves or not. As economists, which most of us are in one form or another, we have to believe that price signals and sustained shifts in demand eventually do lead to changes. You know, in two years from now, I do expect the world's semiconductor supply, for example, to be much more diversified and much more reliable. It might be three years. It's probably not going to be less than two years, but it will happen. The, the issue is, in a world of, of national governments, do you start having... The, the redundancies being built in beyond, well beyond what's economically efficient. So, I mean, if we listen to Professor Marin or, or to Sven, I think rightly they emphasized that there was this sort of a, a organic overshoot of complex supply chains. They just sort of developed and ex post, at least this is my interpretation of some of the data trends they and others have established, Ex post, companies sort of woke up and said, oh my God, I'm too vulnerable to an earthquake here, a military problem there, a disruption. I'm too single sourced at this particular spot in the supply chain. And it wasn't because they were stupid. It was because some manager at some point in the supply chain said, oh, I can get it cheaper by moving there. And then only now does everybody sort of wake up and look back and see what has developed. Um, and figure it out. So we're, they're buying insurance by building redundancies. My concern when I talk about the corrosion of globalization is there will be a big political component to how those redundancies are allocated, um, which is inefficiency is fine, but it may cause much bigger problems. 
So, I mean, you can put a positive spin on this. People mentioned, I, I believe, Sandra, you might have mentioned the WTO Director General uh, Ngozi Okanye Iweala has talked about the potential opportunity for some middle and low income countries coming out of rechoring. But in the overall global economic sphere, this is probably going to be a trend that reduces returns on capital, reduces economies of scale over the next few years. Yeah. Yeah, clear. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, as we are hopefully has some uh, counter arguments here because that's indeed uh, that those are pretty depressing uh, thoughts, Adam. Um, it's always better to follow Adam rather than to precede him because he lays the analytical foundation for a discussion so well. Um, he actually touched upon a point that I um, was uh, um, uh, intending to make as well. The fact that we are now in a phase where there is clearly the need to recognize a trade-off between efficiency and resilience. And it's worth thinking about um, uh, connecting this to the discussion that we've had about um, permanent versus transitory effects of certain changes. About a couple of decades ago, you was, we seemed to be at the threshold. And in fact, we did experience this glorious era of globalization when trade barriers were falling, transportation costs were falling, and there were a variety of other factors that led to um, you know, growth in um, global trade linkages. Now, some of those factors have reversed. Um, certainly, one might make the argument that the uh, huge spike in transportation costs might be the result of transitory factors, and it could uh, normalize. But other factors, as uh, um, Adam correctly pointed out, are not necessarily going away. The um, geopolitical environment has uh, shifted um, such that some trade barriers are not going to go away for the foreseeable future. Um, and what this uh, necessarily implies is uh, um, a twofold approach uh, to trying to increase resilience. And that is either onshoring um, or diversification of uh, supply chains. And which way this cuts ends up having some implications for globalization. Um, you know, here in the US, we had um, uh, the Biden administration recently announcing that it was going to emphasize uh, um, domestic procurement um, in support of the infrastructure spending um, uh, that was um, passed in a bill um, uh, recently. Um, on the other hand, one can think about, as Adam pointed out, uh, many firms deciding that they need to look at um, a variety of alternative uh, suppliers, which could in fact lead to potentially more investment, potentially more uh, global force, although um, at the cost of efficiency. Um, and this is a, a, a reality that I think businesses and countries are going to have to deal with where they come out on this uh, frontier and the trade-off between efficiency and resilience. And my worry is that we could be moving towards um, a world where policy um, choices um, lead us to um, substantially um, reducing the focus on efficiency and forcing both firms and uh, countries more generally to think about resilience as being the key factor that they should be focused on, which might ultimately not be good um, uh, in terms of world trade or in terms of um, uh, world productivity, growth and welfare. Um Yes, uh, thank you. And I, I will go. I will come to Dalia in in a second. Um, but I would like to ask a question here because um, do you think that the uh, that uh, diversification uh, as a way of becoming more resilient might require more investments? But do you think that those investments are um, yeah basically investments to uh, not deteriorate or at least keep the status quo or are these productive investments? And that basically, I think, does relate uh, back to uh, Adam's point that he's worried about uh, productivity and innovation. So here again, policy um, choices are going to be crucial. And as Adam um, pointed out, there is this uh, a more nationalistic orientation we are seeing. It, um, you know, there is an additional um, overlay as well with some of the um, 
uh, nature economies on the advanced side of the um, world versus the emerging market side of the world splitting up um, into regional configurations, um, but there might be more um, integration at the region level. So you could have these two forces um, uh, working at the same time greater regionalization in both trade and finance, um, and at the same time, less globalization, if you think about um, the world as a whole. So these two phenomena can coexist, but the reality is that that does imply at least one very significant cleavage that could have implications for trade flows, financial flows, and even for the sort of knowledge flows that ultimately um, underpin productivity growth. Thank you. Uh, Dalia. Yeah, I want to add to the discussion on efficiency versus resilience. Um, there is actually a market failure here um, because firms would like to uh, make their supply chains more resilient by using more input suppliers. But the problem is that sometimes these, uh, they don't have the input suppliers. There are no other suppliers on other continents uh, that they can switch to. So there is a, uh, actually there is a research uh, in uh, macro that uses a macro model with supply chains. And that, that model shows that when you have a very asymmetric situation between one input supplier and several producers, there is a, there, the, 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 the economy is not resilient and a, a, a shock lead propagates to the whole economy and has multiplier effects. So there is a clear case here that the government should intervene actually. And I wouldn't call it nationalism if the government starts now to say we should uh, make sure that we have input suppliers in the US and the Europeans say we should make sure we have input suppliers in Europe because basically the, the gov government should make sure that firms find sufficient input suppliers on different continents because that's the only way for them to diversify. So yes, the cost is efficiency, but if, if, the, if the supply shock comes, uh, yes, so that's the cost. Yes, there is a cost in efficiency, but you buy more resilience and that makes a lot of economic sense. Yes, thank you. I, I would like to um, point this remark to, to, back to Sven because um, you said before that that there is some empirical evidence of this letter of credits in the banking sector that point to diversification. So how do you square this with uh, Dalia's remarks here? Oh, I, of course, if you go to more diversification, there could be inefficiency effects. We should also talk about what the minimum efficient scale is of that and whether if we start to reorganize it, not politically, but uh, efficiently, you know, you could get off a little better. I think there's one inefficiency or one issue that's not discussed so much in these disruptions, which is time lags. You know, people say in Germany now, you know, wouldn't it be easy if we switch on the nuclear facilities again? And there might even be some sentiment that the nuclear facilities should be switched on uh, because we need the energy. First of all, it takes 12 to 16 months to get the new fuel rods. Yeah. Uh, and we are living in this just in time world, you know, uh, where you know, we were thinking that we could live with five days of stock in diesel. Yeah, so, sorry, so th that works in a perfect system. So, so I think we're all learning this kind of uh, uh, detailed stuff. But I think the, the let's just do this stuff, that I would be very careful with, but, and in particular if it's not well calculated. Because the let's do the, the, just this stuff, you know, get you to do stuff that doesn't work. And I actually think we're currently, there's many, many people working on what's the fastest way to rebuild the energy supply of Germany independent of Russia. And the answer is actually not 100% clear. At the moment, as a result, we're doing all out. Let's build LNG, let's do this, let's do wind, let's do this, and we just build everything. Somewhere in the all out strategy, there will be inefficiency. Now, at the moment, it's a security issue, so you don't, maybe you don't care. Uh, but I think, what we really all need to get better at 
is understanding some of the economics of the large systems. And I want to reinforce one point that Dale, you made. I think we're also learning that the energy system is not independent of the rest. And the material system is also not. If you're short materials and you're short energy, everything is down. While other sectors, you know, if there's more cookies or not, doesn't matter to the automotive industry. But if there's more energy or not, or materials or not, matters to almost all industries. And I believe one of the reasons why we are going to be in heightened volatility is because we're playing around with the energy system in a massive way. And it's going to cut through all the sectors. I think it's one area of study. I don't know, Adam, would you would agree, but this would be one area where I think economic analysis would have to be strengthened to understand that it's not a separate system, but it goes like this. And if you play around with the energy system in the wrong way, you actually distort everything. Yeah. And what do you mean exactly with the wrong way? I'm sorry. Right, sorry, I, I just saying I, I'm not intervening because I'm nodding. That's all. all right. No, but what I mean with the distorting is, so at the moment, what we were doing is why the energy market is so tight is we were doing the right thing for net zero, which is to build down the fossil fuels. But if you don't yeah. build a new at the same pace, you're just building in a very tight system or even a short system. And the inflation did not happen due to Ukraine. 80% of it happened before. Yeah. And it might sustain longer due to this event uh, because we might get additional shortage. But what we're doing now is you have a regulated cut on uh, one sort of supply and an unregulated build of the other. And if the economics of those two don't work, because who pays is not settled in this system on our new energy system, it's not settled. So if you know who pays is not settled and you just cut on one side to assume that the rest will be built is, is I think, dangerous. And that doesn't mean that we should not build the new, but you can't decelerate the old faster than the new gets built. Otherwise, you built in this shortage and then one shock like Russia will just destroy the whole system. And that's why we and, and you know, you if Russia has not yet cut the supply, but just imagine you get a 20 percent cut as a counter sanction that's we're not built for that at all you know then you basically get what the germans said when we need to first shut down the chemical industry then we do this then we do the heating uh, you know, and you know, i hope we don't ever get there but but we have an important study actually on uh, energy boycotts of germany and how that will affect the german economy and this study actually finds that the, the effect of stopping Russian gas is not going to be catastrophic. And the reason why it's not going to be catastrophic is because the, the economy is resilient and in a complex economy, there are always possible other input suppliers and firms can switch to other energy inputs. I mean, it's going to, output is, is going to fall by up to 2% of GDP in Germany. Uh, but uh, between 0 0.0 and 2% of GDP, so that's their estimate. And it depends very much on the size of the, um, the substitution, uh, elasticity of substitution. I don't explain it here now exactly, but it basically measures how easy the German economy can switch from gas to other energy inputs and find new suppliers like Norway or the Netherlands and maybe Qatar and so on. So basically... Okay. It's not going but, uh, to Daria, I just want to say this field is being studied. I know Guntram was when it comes in. I've seen studies that will take two to three years to replace the gas. Two to three years. And then if you get a 50% cut, it can actually go down 10%. So I, I'm just not 100% sure. It, yeah, I, I, not I sure also, I do think that, um, oh, actually, your, your image is a stock, but I can hear everybody fine. I hope the same goes for you uh, on your side. Um, I do think that the, um, uh, the, the study, Dahlia, that you mentioned is uh, a little bit criticized. I think and that that mainly comes down to the issue that um, it does make an assumption that, uh, the, the, that Germany is basically uh, the only country dealing with the issue. And that, of course, is pretty different from reality. 
Yeah, but that's not a major mm -hmm. issue in this study. <clears throat> I mean, the study takes into account other countries because it's an open economy macro model. So it's not looking as if Germany is, is, uh, is acting in isolation. It's a very cred credible study, actually, that uses the <laughs> the art modeling and with detailed knowledge of the energy market. So I know there are other studies out there, but I trust this one very much because the person, the people who have worked yeah. on the study are very credible. And I mean, if I can compliment on this, um, I mean, uh, first of all, this study is indeed a pretty, pretty good study, but it's also corroborated by um, what, what other institutes, um, including uh, the major German um, uh, research institutes <clears throat> uh, are forecasting in their own in their own uh, forecasts. I mean, in their in their for, um, general economic forecast models um, under the assumption of of basically no gas imports. Um, uh, and if I if I may just add, I mean, what I think is a little bit underestimated sometimes in the popular debate or in debate like this one here is that, um, of course, the price increase that we are seeing has already demand effects, right? I mean, we are, we are estimating, for example, that the current price increase has already led to uh, sort of, just without any further government intervention, has led to already a reduction of something like, I'm trying to, was trying to get the precise number, five or 10% um, reduction in gas demand um, in, uh, in the EU, just, the, just an endogenous response to the price increase. And then, of course, there are substitution uh, effects that are, that are ongoing. I mean, there's substitution uh, towards um, coal, there's substitution towards, uh, towards other forms of energy. But let's put it this way. I, I would agree with those saying a complete cut of Russian fossil fuel uh, imports uh, from Europe um, would be a, a really, really big event because it it would basically uh, not just be an event in Europe, it would have a huge effect on the global energy markets, right? Because Russia is the biggest fossil fuel, fuel import, uh, exporter, um, I think, even in the world. Um, and so so cutting, cutting Russia, if Europe cuts Russia completely, um, the trick is Russia doesn't in the short term have alternative um, uh, supply avenues. In the short term, there's very limited gas pipelines to China. Uh, so just one, which is very limited. And for even for oil, um, the uh, the pipeline infrastructure, I mean, it mostly goes through pipeline infrastructure to, to, to Europe. And that those pipelines, I mean, you can try to sort of replace it with ships. But that's also in the short term going to be very difficult for uh, for, for 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 Russia to do. Huh? So and 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 gas. I mean, gas. Uh, it basically is completely dependent on the pipeline structure, um, and and the ship infrastructure isn't isn't even physically there, right? So so the ships aren't there because you need ships for for liquid LNG. I mean, that's what my my energy economists tell me. So so complete cut. I think would have very uh, would have significant effects on, on global energy markets um, but but um, but I would say um, you know daring to impose a tax um, I mean a tariff on on Putin is something uh, that that we can do because the um, the alternatives uh, for Russia to supply um, their fossil fuel elsewhere are very limited and in fact if they were to stop producing, it would even destroy some of their production um, production fields and production capacities. So there would be even a, a big negative cost, so to speak. I mean, um, a decline in the value of their production capacity. So, so in that sense, you know, I, I, I do. I mean, uh, I, I don't. I, I haven't done any estimates on how big the effect on the economy um, is. I think Dalia, you, the, the study you cite by by Rudi Bachmann and many, many others, Moritz Schularek, etc. I mean, it's, it, I think it's a very serious study. The economic research institutes also come with, with GDP effects of some three, two, three, five, perhaps five percent of GDP. Yeah, but it's not. Um, and none of them come to the conclusion that sort of um, everything will collapse, uh, such as the industry lobbyists um, uh, uh, like, to, like to say. So in that sense, yes, it's a big political question and a political decision, but it's, let's also, I mean, 
be reasonable in terms of what it what it means. Um, yes, there are there are strong effects, um, but it's not the end of the world. Huh? Yeah, thank you. And um, maybe uh, one element to add here on the on indeed the energy efficiency implications for households in in such a uh, in in such a decision. Um, we, we have. Uh, we use in, in the bank where I work, we, we analyze uh, financial transactions by uh, 5 million households in the Netherlands. And one thing that we found was that the, um, the energy component of the uh, consumer price uh, inflation um, is, uh, is, is basically uh, a statistics that assumes that every household renews uh, every energy contract every month. And that is in practice uh, not what is happening in most European countries. Um, and so what we see, if we look at the real energy payments uh, to uh, energy providers by, by, by Dutch households, it's about one fifth of that price increase. So instead of over 100 percent uh, year on year uh, energy price increases, it's about 20. And, um, and also, if we look at the distribution, it's, it's much less, much, much less dramatic than the CPI energy component uh, assumes. And I think that is part due, due to the contracts that people have, with, which is just a delay in time, of course, of, of the problem. But it's also due to the um, uh, energy uh, efficiency that households are uh, massively uh, conveying, because we also look at uh, debit transactions into uh, energy efficiency investments of uh, people's real estate. And that's also strongly going up. So I do. I think that's a that's a very important element uh, to that discussion. Um, okay. So let me. I just have always have to scroll to the right and to the left to see if there are more people raising their hands. I'm sorry if I don't see uh, one of you. Um, no, no more hands. So I think that. Uh, um, so, so we have during this discussion uh, moved uh, quite um, smoothly into the into the policy options area, but maybe it's an idea to to kind of focus on that for for um, for a minute more. Um, so let's say that 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 we're in this situation and and we um, we would do this uh, energy embargo. Um, in the context of moving away from efficiency towards more resilience, either by di diversification or stock stockpiling or uh, in whatever way. So um, I'm wondering uh, what are, so, so given that the implications uh, could be bigger or smaller, depending on, on how resilient uh, you assume economies are, what are the best policy descriptions, prescriptions um, to deal with that situation going forward? Taking also into the account, I think something that we haven't all even touched upon yet is the counterfactual economic implications of not doing the energy transition. Uh, because uh, Sven, you talked about the problem that arises if we basically phase out the old while we haven't uh, phased in the new or scaled up the new. Uh, but the alternative economic implications of the uh, current policy trajectory are increasingly shown as to be enormous. Uh, the second IPCC trilogy showed this very clearly. So I do think that it is relevant to also keep that in mind when we think about these policy prescriptions. Um, who wants to kick that off? Yeah, Guntram, go ahead. I mean, uh, look. Uh, now I'm talking a lot, but I mean, just just a few words on this on this climate issue. I mean, I think the first the first really important point to me is that um, we need to invest into climate adaptation. Huh? So so so, no matter what kind of climate policies the world will implement, climate change is with us and will uh, become uh, more relevant and, and and bigger before it it starts reversing. Hopefully if ever, right? So, so we are now in a world where um, temperatures has ra have raised already by one, one degree Celsius. And, you know, we are, we are going to end up with more than that. Huh? So this is, this is already for sure. And so, so climate adaptation 
is to my mind uh, an under-researched and under-invested area. Um, climate adaptation is something that is relevant also for advanced economies. Um, it's not just sort of developing economies um, somewhere in the Sahara uh, that are affected by climate change. We know now that, um, you know, um, storms in the US, um, in Europe, droughts, um, et cetera. I mean, they are all relevant for us. And so, so we need to, to, to invest more in, the, in that. So, so this, this is the first point. The, the second point um, is of course that uh, climate mitigation policies um, will, be, will be also very costly, um, that, that's for sure. Um, uh, they involve a lot of private investment, but some public investment um, also. And, you know, the estimates that I've seen is that um, for uh, an economic area such as the European Union, we, we basically have to invest something like three to four hundred billion euros uh, per year in additional um, uh, energy and transport um, infrastructure um, investments to reduce our um, um, emissions um, by basically the 50 55 percent or so until 2030 so so this is this is very big uh, investments this is not all public investment huh? so um it's uh, a lot of this most of this is actually private um, and you know you need the right policies co2 pricing etc cetera, etc cetera, to get the private sector to do it but it, it, but it is macroeconomically significant i mean we are talking here of additional investments in energy and transport system in the order of magnitude of something like 2% of GDP. Huh? So, so this is the kind of number uh, I think that we have to uh, have to look at. Um, and I, I think for me, one very interesting question, I would love to hear um, uh, people that, that are doing even more macroeconomics, sort of what are the implications of this increased investment if it were to happen globally? And let's say if, let's say the EU and the US were to do this, um, what are the implications on the on the real uh, real interest rate? I mean, the real equilibrium interest rate, um, or the global saving and investment balances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, there I, I find this a fascinating question, and I I haven't seen so much research on this. Um, I think the um, the European Central Bank tends to think that. Um, equilibrium interest rates remain low and will will not increase as a consequence. Um, uh, I think their argument is more based on a sort of volatility, um, a volatility argument. Um, but to me, the, the quantity argument, I mean, that if, if we really do these 2% additional investment, um, it, it, I think, is, is, I mean, it seems to me that this needs to prevail, but I, I, it's more, more a feeling here, I have to admit that this 2% more investment will actually lead to an increase in the in the real equilibrium interest rate. And, and if that's the case, of course, it has major implications for yeah, central banking for, I mean, for lots of things, right? So, so, so I, I find this personally, uh, one of the most sort of interesting uh, policy questions in the climate area um, that, that we should be looking at at the moment. And sorry, I, I, I just sort of brought those two points um, here for general yeah. discussion. Thanks. Yes, let, let's, let's keep them in mind and also go back to that because I think they're very relevant. But I would first like to move to Carlos. I think you, Sandra, just to add, uh, when it comes to policy responses, one, of, one uh, factor in uh, shaping the current shock to energy prices is also the policy responses, the near-term policy responses uh, that governments are implementing in, in many economies which so far has focused on uh, when it comes to energy, for instance, and, and also to food, in some cases, to tax cuts and subsidies. And these kinds of policy responses can actually exacerbate the uh, global uh, supply shortfalls that we are seeing. And there is a less, less, less focus on longer term measures that would reduce the ban and encourage uh, uh, alternative sources of supplies. Uh, of course, it's this easier said it than done, and as it's been said, these things take a lot of time. In the near term, uh, being cognizant of the implications of uh, tax cuts and subsidies on in how uh, this shock is exacerbated, uh, in the near term, uh, there needs to be a greater focus on uh, targeted uh, uh, support rather than 
that, that's got subsidies or even a price control, which can, as we know, be quite uh, distortionary. And then, and in the longer term, uh, how to uh, invest in energy efficiency that could be with the recession of buildings, it could be increased automobile efficiency requirements and, uh, and other factors, but being, of course, mindful that these things uh, do take time. And uh, finally, uh, there is this issue of how uh, biofuels are an appropriate use of agricultural resources. Of course, the energy price increases have increased the inputs for agricultural production. And, um, but this biofuel use has implications for the spikes in natural fuel prices, has implications of, uh, of uh, this implication in terms of the, uh, you know, impact, uh, uh, the, the environmental benefits that these biofuels can take place given the significant amount of energy required in production, particularly for ethanol. But let me stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just may, maybe one clarification question about what you said about the these uh, subsidies uh, uh, to cushion the the impact of the uh, energy inflation. Let's let's focus on that one. That could uh, exaggerate the problem, um, but but I do think that uh, that whether that happens really depends on the on the real wage implications, right, of the inflation problem, because in in the euro area where we have very modest wage growth. Uh, inflation is uh, causing a, a, a lower uh, real wage, and so and and so then I think the subsidies uh, are not immediately um, exaggerating the problem. Or do, do you disagree? No, no, you, you make a good point. It's basically the is fundamentally a supply demand uh, uh, um, a, 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 a equilibrium issue. If certain policies. Uh, and I'm talking, and I know this is a very difficult policy choice, but if certain policies such as the you know, gap between supply and demand, even though these policies make sense in other, you know, for, for other reasons, this, uh, the issue of how to increase supplies, how to uh, uh, help adjust demand in the longer term is, is, to, is something to take to, to the take yeah. into account. Yeah, clear. Um, yes, Sven. Uh, I just want to start also where Guntram, you left off with, you know, if you have a 2% or it's 3% or 1% cost of the transition, I think at the moment we live in a limbo a little bit because it's not settled who pays. And we know that the amount, not I'm not talking from a long-term return or IRR perspective, but the amount that needs to be paid is way above the yellow vest level that we've seen in France. And that's why it's for politicians very hard to settle the price uh because then it would you know put it on the consumer or the citizen but at the other end you could say well okay governments have to finance it, it you know you do two percent for 30 years and you're out there with another 60 percent debt to gdp or 100 percent debt to gdp i think until we will have a proper context of who pays and who finances this issue will not move by itself the rate that we have right now in terms of renewing the energy mix is the rate that we get out of a capitalist, call it equilibrium with a bit of subsidy and a bit of regulation. Uh, but until the price is settled and who pays, I think this will just be an open issue where people continue to talk targets and the targets tighten because the time runs out and then the targets tighten because the time runs out and it gets worse and then the financing cost gets higher. And then you know, you're know you in this loop that doesn't solve. So I wonder whether we should, there is a w place in the world where you move like this is the amount we can afford. Let's go do it with that. And then, you know, that then brings into the discussion that the remainder might have to be adaptation and a few other things. Uh, yeah. And for some reason, that discussion cannot be fully had because then you're sort of, you know, you're taking the bull by the horns in a way. And But I do think that needs to be done. Otherwise, you get this grinding of, you know, let's just cut the fossil fuels through financing mechanisms, which is currently happening, which, you know, over time is the thing that needs to happen. But the reality is, if you do it before you have the alternative, we're really running ourselves into trouble. And and so, so this who pays and who finances needs to be settled. There's a few other things that need to be settled to get it done. But th those first, you know, permitting rights and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, how long will you be guaranteed that this energy is something that's viable so that you don't every five years lose your rights to produce energy on something that takes 30 years to build or something. And so, so I think it's just not a good environment 
for private investment to fully occur uh, and for the government to settle and for the citizens to participate. I actually don't fully know how that will settle, uh, if anyone had an idea how that happens. But without that settlement, you, this is going to be a volatile movement uh, that is very complicated. Yes, that's, uh, that's a very, very crucial point. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. And I think actually it does remind me on, on, of a publication that, um, that Bruegel has uh, um, put out, I mean, a number of years ago on, on the possibilities of a green golden fiscal rule. I don't know if you remember that, Guntram. Uh, the idea was to have the um, uh, stability and growth pact uh, as it's being uh, frozen and, and renegotiated right now as an opportunity to, um, to, to relieve some of the burden on the, on let's say the yellow vest, as Sven calls it, uh, in, in, into a pre-financing uh, by public investments. Um, okay, maybe let, let that uh, simmer for a moment. And first let's go to Dahlia, to your remark. <laughs> yes, I wanted to... Uh, mention that uh, the, the Green Deal by the European Commission and the CHIPS Act to invest in diversification, these investments have actually led to a reindustrialization of East Germany. Uh, you might not know, but East Germany was suffering by, for 30 years of deindustrialization because of policy mistakes. And now, uh, because of the Green Deal, uh, the, the governments in the lender have the money to try to give uh, subsidies for firms to come to East Germany and to invest there. And that is leading now to a whole, you know, a, what economists call an agglomeration effect. So this investment by two big firms like Intel and Tesla have made the, look, the region very attractive. And now many firms are coming and starting to invest there. And this is precisely what economic uh, theory would predict, namely that this, this investment leads to an agglomeration effect that more auto firms and more uh, chip firms will come to East Germany. And it's the first time that you will see an industrialization of this region, which is quite um, amazing. Yeah, but, but I think your point, Dahlia, does, um, does link back to, um, to what, what Guntram said before, is that what are the interest uh, rate implications of all that? And, and, I, and I guess in a way, whether these agglomeration effects are there also depends on the, uh, the capacity constraints that an economy has, right? Because there's, there's the investments required and there's the um, the capacity constraints, particularly. I think if you, if you talk about Germany, for example, uh, there are massive labor shortages, um, and and so um, if if you run into the capacity constraints, then basically investments do not have that money that much growth lifting potential, uh, and and then um, it will just go into uh, additional inflation. I mean, they can import, the, in, in the, the investors can import the labor because there's not much labor left in East Germany anyway, because all the good people have left because there was no prospect in the East German region anyway. So it will require for, for workers to come back to East Germany from all over the world. And I think uh, this will happen. Hmm. Yes. Um, Guntram, do you want to say something to that? Well, I mean, you, since you mentioned the study that, of course, I remember because it was only last year and I wrote it last year, so uh, my memory um, still serves me well. Um, uh, so, so on this study, I mean, what we were basically trying to do is um, thinking about um, the the public um, part of the investment and and again I think I very much agree with with Sven um, 
that there is no agreement at the moment who pays, right? And, and it, it, it is that uncertainty that also holds back some of the investments. And what you see now is, of course, I mean, the social dimension of energy prices is enormous. Um, and uh, what governments are now doing um, uh, also in response to the uh, to the Ukraine and the energy increase uh, in the wake of the Ukraine uh, war, the war in Ukraine um, is of course exactly the wrong thing. They are they are trying to sort of uh, reduce the cost the cost of energy by by lifting taxes there um, instead of um, you know um, helping those that are in need with lump sum lump sum transfers. So so. Um, so there, there is, I mean, there is clearly, uh, of course, um, a social dimension and a political dimension to, to energy, which um, goes well beyond um, the pay grade of, of an economist and, and beca it becomes very political and politicized. Um, um, and so I totally agree with Sven, uh, with Sven on this issue of, uh, you know, who pays is, is not fully settled. And as long as that's not fully settled, Investments are also not not yet uh, undertaken because you know people are basically waiting and and hoping to companies are waiting and hoping that somebody else will will pick up the bill. Um, so so this is this is the big issue. And what what our study was was doing is I mean we were just looking at the um, public uh, part of um, the investment need and um, the basic assumption was that we were saying well at the moment on average in the EU a quarter of energy and transport investments currently are done by the public sector. Three quarters are done by the private sector, a quarter by the public sector. If you take that ratio, and it, there are differences across countries, so this is an average of the EU. If you take that ratio um, and you apply it to the 400, so, so you end up with something like 100 billion government uh, investment, and that's 0.5% that's or so of, of GDP. And then we basically just said, look, if, if in a fiscal consolidation period, you try to increase investments by 0 0.5, I mean, then you must be um, a master in, in political uh, convince, in politics, because what typically happens in a fiscal consolidation period is that the one thing that's easier to cut is investments, right? So public investments typically are cut in a, in a, um, in a recovery phase from a recession when you know uh, deficits go down. Um, and, and here you want to actually increase it by 0 0.5. So, so politically, this doesn't add up. And that's why we were suggesting um, some sort of a golden rule or however you want to call it, so that you, know, you create the, the incentive to, to actually do this kind of investment, even if otherwise you, you try to undertake um, uh, fiscal consolidations. So sorry, that, that was my study. But since you mentioned it, I, I thought I, I quickly... Somewhere. Yeah, I think it's really, really relevant here in this discussion. Um, Adam looks like he is moving towards the unmute button. <laughs> um, no, I just, you know, it's been a very rich discussion and I appreciate Dahlia and Gunfram and others getting into the nitty gritty of uh, German or European adjustment policies to, to climate. I, I think we have to, again, I'm sorry to keep shifting the ground, but I, I think we have to confront the fact as our, many of our colleague, uh, John Pisani Ferry did in a piece he wrote about six months ago, that the, the macroeconomic perspective on this is, is probably pretty difficult. And doesn't mean that it outweighs the need to make climate change adjustment, but it does mean that the, the, the likely short-term impacts are to be more disruptive and, not, and more on the unemployment side, I think, than the growth side or more on the reallocation side than the, than the overall demand side. Um, and I think someone may have mentioned this, but I think it bears repeating. You know, we can say, and I think Sandra, you did, that it's okay to try to compensate households for the sudden spike in energy. But looking at this from a political economy perspective, if we can't, none of our governments, and I include the US in this, obviously, uh, can't use 
the terrible news of what's going on in Ukraine, giving us the windfall of a sudden jump in carbon prices that we can blame on something else. And we can't use that to, to really force some, uh, an acceleration of our adjustment and force a new floor on carbon prices. That shows us political economy terms, how much of a mess we're in. Um, so anyway, I-, I Yeah, I, but, I, but, but just, to, yeah, that, that's a really good point. But I think um, the, the study that Dalia mentioned earlier actually ends with a policy prescription. That's exactly what you say that we cannot do, right? Or I don't know if I remember correctly, but no, I, no, no. I, I, I'm well aware. I've read the study. I, I'm well aware yeah. of the study, and so I'm not so saying I'm possible? the only one saying this. But what I want you to see is that no, nobody's listening. Um, every country, every advanced income, high income economy, is at least considering cuts in energy taxes, subsidies on energy expenditure, household transfers. And if that's the case now, how are we gonna get through this, this whole long transition? So I, I, Sandra, I literally don't follow you. I mean, if you wanna point out, yeah, I'm not yeah. the only one pointing this out, that's fine. But the fact that a bunch of highly qualified academic economists say this would be better and no one's listening to them seems to make my point, not your point. No, but but I well maybe I misunderstood, but but I think that their point is not to uh, go against uh, uh, reality right now by imposing such a carbon tax. I thought the proposal was to use to make in a way use of the current uh, political situation by introducing a slow fading in of carbon pricing as the um, price shock. Uh, on the energy side is fading out. So I don't think anybody is proposing to, uh, you know, to put things on top of that. That would be very, very theoretical and in, indeed pretty incredible. But I think what they're proposing is a, is a smart fading in structure. And I'm, so and I'm saying it's an idealistic, dumb facing in structure. We have to get moving. I mean, the Gilles Jean, if we let the Gilles Jean or Joe Manchin's corporate supporters in the in the coal and, and energy industry dominate the discussion. Our, our grandchildren will not survive. So, I mean, yeah. it's time that grown-ups like us on this panel stop indulging in this bullshit. It, it's okay. enough. That's clear. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's very clear. Yeah. Okay. Good point. So, that what 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 policy option does that leave us with? That leaves us with the same kind of adjustment that people in Greece and Portugal and Spain and Ireland and Italy suffered through, which is a significant fall in real incomes, but now imposing it on the white people of Germany and Netherlands and the US, instead of only on people who are deemed Southern or of color or weaker. And so if we can successfully impose austerity policies on the Southern countries of Europe, just as we've imposed austerity policies repeatedly throughout the Southern Hemisphere, we damn well should be able to impose austerity policies in the name of climate change on the rich whites of Europe and the US. That's what it means. Okay, so regulation, not pricing. Absolutely, Nick Stern, who's probably the leading economist on this, you'll notice in the last couple of years has given up on the idea that he was the one of the lead authors along with Nordhaus and a few others of the concept yeah. that we were gonna have this gradual thing and do price adjustments and this would take care of it. And you'll notice that over the last couple of years in his public statements, he's given up and said, no, we need regulation. That's obviously not gonna work. Yeah, but but I'm, I'm sorry to push you back on this, but I think that what Nick Stern also says, it regulation is not sufficient. So we need regulation, we need pricing. But we need, I mean, but it's also going to lead to a large scale societal transformations that is going to one way Again, or Again, Sandra, or what I'm pushing back on is the eternal presumption that we keep saying you can't make the average people, which is by definition the angry white males in northern societies, have any adjustment. When we go around forcing adjustment 
on women, on people of color, on smaller economies, on Southern economies all the time, repeatedly. Yeah. So it is incorrect to suggest that we do not have the power to impose adjustment on people. It is factually incorrect. We choose not to pose, impose adjustment with what you call regulation on white yeah. males. And, and Nick Stern, I'm just citing that as an example, not necessarily that he's the gospel, although he's brilliant, but an example of how far someone who put a lot of faith in the price mechanism has come. Yeah. No, fully agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's um, actually, that's actually a perfect ending to this discussion. I'm always, I'm actually, I was thinking we have four more minutes, but um, unless somebody wants to say something very pressing here, just going to give that a minute. Maybe Sven wants to respond. Um, no. So I want to really uh, thank uh, everybody on this panel. Uh, thank the audience. I think everybody stayed from the beginning till the end. And that's not surprising because um, very inspiring session, uh, a lot of information. And um, I want to thank you all uh, a lot for taking part in this. OK. Thank you Bye. so much, Sandra. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.